I am <coughs> overwhelmed by the generous and kind words of uh, Mr. Pinto, so much so that uh, I'm dying to listen to my own speech. <laughs> Dear members of the family of uh, Dr. C.P. Srivastava, distinguished guests, dear friends and students, a special welcome to Ms. Zolani, who has come all the way from the United States to be with us today. A few things in life would give me greater joy than coming to, Indi to India to honor in his native country one of the greatest men I have come across in my life, Dr. Chandrika Prasad Srivastava. It was therefore with a resounding yes that I responded to the kind invitation of the governing council of the Talani Maidan Institute to deliver the inaugural Dr. C.P. Srivastava Memorial Lecture here in Mumbai. Even if that would imply missing the final match of uh, Wimbledon, the tennis tournament on Sunday, and missing also today's and tomorrow's semi-finals at the World Cup. <laughs> For Dr. Sivastava, has been a father figure to me since we first met in the early 1970s. Was the man who literally brought me in IMO, the leader who became my mentor and role model and influenced, more than anybody else, my international career. To come here to India, to pay him the due tribute today, on the first anniversary of his birthday, since his, since his death on 18 July 2013, is the, for the least I can do to express my gratitude and honor his memory. And I congratulate the leaders of the Institute which Dr. Srivastava served as founding chairman of its governing council from 1998 to 2004, and therefore as chairman emeritus, thereafter as chairman emeritus till his death, for their commendable decision to establish this memorial lecture in his honor. What a thoughtful initiative indeed, and how appropriate that we celebrate in this manner the life of a great man who left an indelible mark on the organization, he said, with unique success and distinction for 16 solid years. He left a mark on shipping in general and on the lives of so many people who have benefited enormously from his hard work, his wise counsel, his exemplary professional and family life, and the institutions he founded with vision and led during their formative years with commitment and dedication. I therefore consider it quite appropriate that before I move on to speak to you on the subject that I've chosen for the occasion, I say, like others did before me, a few things about the man we have gathered here to honor today. The presence of one of his beloved daughters, <coughs> Mrs. Sadna Bauman, and uh, her husband, <coughs> with other members of the family, adds my pleasure and contributes enormously to the success of this inaugural lecture. The Christian Vasavez, we heard earlier on, was born on 8 July 1920 and was educated in Lugo, where he obtained the MA, MA and LLB, LLB degrees. He started his career as a civil servant in the Indian Administrative Service in Rood and Blacknow before moving in 1964 to the post of Joint Secretary in the office of the then Prime Minister, Lal Bahadur Shastri. Earlier in his career, he demonstrated his leadership talents in the fields of seafarers training and welfare. Between 1947 and 1948, he played a key role in the establishment of a network of new maritime training institutions, 
which have since produced world-class maritime personnel, greatly facilitating the growth of Indian shipping in the years following independence. After his stint, after the Director General of Shipping, he became the Founder Chief Executive of the Shipping Corporation of India, the Government of India Enterprise, which he led to become the largest shipping company of India and one of the biggest and most successful shipping companies in the world, with a diversified fleet of cargo liners, tankers, bulk carriers, and passenger ships. But his exceptionally outstanding work as chairman, managed the managed director of the Shipping Corporation of India, and in recognition of his contribution to establishing one of the most successful public sector undertakings in India, in 1972, he was awarded the Padma Bhushan, one of the country's highest civilian awards. In 1974, he was elected Secretary General of the, as that time was called, Intergovernmental Maritime Consultative Organization, later the International Maritime Organization, an amendment he himself thought of and, and uh, uh, did a lot of good hard work to accomplish, a post in which he was re-elected unanimously for three successive four-year terms, serving until his retirement in 1989. While earlier in his post, the Secretary General of IMO, Dr. Sivastava recognized the crucial importance of the human element in ensuring safety, safety and efficiency in international shipping, and directed much of his energy towards assisting developing countries in particular to develop their maritime potential and give effect to their shipping aspirations through properly educating and training their youths in maritime profession. He thus became the founding father and, the, and also the first chancellor of the World Maritime University established in Malmö, Sweden in 1983 to address the pressing need for trained maritime professionals in the de developing world. As if establishing the World Maritime University was not enough, he assiduously worked to found the International Maritime Law Institute in Malta and the International Maritime Academy in Trieste in Italy, accomplishments for which he is credited with all the planning, negotiating, fundraising, organizing, and coordinating the work needed to take a vision and turn it into reality. During his tenure as Secretary General of IMO, the membership of the organization increased considerably. His relentless efforts to make IMO known to the developing world and for encouraging developing countries to join the rich men's club, as IMO was often referred to at the time, were widely recognized worldwide. This shaped the structure of the organization's membership to its present status, whereby two-thirds of the 170 strong membership and three associate members consists of developing countries, which are making a significant contribution to the work of the organization and the shipping industry as a whole. Dr. Sivasava's leadership of IMO is justly associated with the development and adoption of a series of international conventions. Among these, I will mention the 1973 International Convention on the Prevention of Marine Pollution from Ships, supplemented by a protocol adopted in 1978 by the Tanker Safety and Pollution Prevention Conference, the International Convention on Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping for Seafarers, amended, as Mr. Painter said, in 2010 by the Manila Amendments, the International Convention on Maritime Search and Rescue in 1979, the Convention for the Suppression of Unlawful Acts Against the Safety of Maritime Navigation, in other words, against terrorism at sea, and the related protocol for the suppression of unlawful acts against the safety of fixed platforms on the continental shelf, not to mention the plethora of codes, recommended practices, 
and guidelines that saw the light of day while he was at the helm of IMO. During his tenure, a comprehensive, pragmatic, and well-coordinated program of technical cooperation in favor of developing countries was conceived and developed, and effective steps were taken to promote its successful implementation to the benefit of not only the country's concerned, but shipping and world trade at large. Just before his retirement from the organization in 1989, the IMO Assembly, through a unanimously adopted resolution, paid due tribute to him for his exceptionally meritorious services to the organization and to shipping as a whole, which he had rendered with total commitment to its ideals and objectives. In doing so, the Assembly recognized that as a result of his hard work, leadership, integrity, dedicated endeavors and initiatives, the worldwide standing and membership of the organization had significantly increased, and its universality was established. Many conventions and protocols had received wide acceptance and had come into force, promoting the objectives of the organization while the IMO spirit of goodwill and cooperation had been solidly rooted, sustained, and enhanced. In acknowledging Dr. Sivastava's contribution to IMO, shipping, and the environment, in particular his visionary and pioneering role and his ceaseless efforts in establishing the World Maritime University and the International Maritime Law Institute, the Assembly conferred upon him the title IMO Secretary General Emeritus. 1990, in recognition of his services and contribution to international shipping, Queen Elizabeth conferred upon him the title of Honorary Knight Commander of the Most Distinguished Order of St. Michael and St. George, which, where he, a British national, is equivalent to serve. In 1991, he received the IMO International Maritime Prize for his contribution to the organization's work and the achievements, the achievement of its objectives. In 2005, he was awarded the Lal Bahadur Shastri National Award for Excellence in Public Administration and Management Sciences by the then President of India, APJ Abdul Kalam. In 2009, he was awarded again by the President of India, the Padma Vibhushan, India's second highest civilian award. Dr. Srivastava's honors and distinctions are too many, and my time too short to mention them all here today. Suffice for me to say that very rarely in one man's lifetime, so many brilliant things were achieved so successfully and so effectively as those that mark the passing from this world of my mentor, your compatriot. Now on to the theme of the Institute, and I have chosen to be the subject of my presentation. Trends and recent developments in shipping and challenges forecast to face the industry in the years ahead. I'll start with a rather sad statement. And this is that I consider it a matter of concern and regret that of all the sectors that make up the global transport infrastructure, shipping probably has the lowest public profile and the least representative public image. Yet, if you look around you, almost everything you see has been touched by shipping in some way. Raw materials, component parts, finished goods, fuel and foodstuffs are all moved around the world by ships. Shipping serves more than 90% of world trade, largely because ships enjoy unrivaled superiority over all other modes of transport when it comes to carrying massive quantities of cargo, cost-effectively, cleanly, and safely. Ships, they are modern, technologically advanced workplaces, 
and go, go about their business efficiently and effectively to the benefit of us all. Being myself a strong advocate of shipping and a proud servant of the industry, I could speak to you for hours explaining without much effort the vital role shipping plays in underpinning international commerce and the world economy as the most efficient, safe, and environmentally international and, and environmentally friendly method of transporting mass quantities of goods around the globe. We live in a global society which is underpinned and supported by a global economy. And that economy should simply could, could simply not function if it were not for ships and the shipping industry. The best means at our disposal for improving the public image of shipping and helping it, to, it gain the recognition it deserves is the removal of any grounds for complaint. And that means working together to prevent accidents from occurring in the first place, to promote safety and to improve the industry's environmental credentials. The fact that shipping today can legitimately claim to be largely safe, secure, efficient, and environmentally friendly is due to the efforts of many individuals and international organizations, with IMO at the summit, who have over, over many years worked hard and are still hard working to serve the industry with dedication and commitment. The man whose memory we honor today stands at the summit of the pyramid. The theme chosen for this memorial lecture has two shipping related components, trends and challenges. As far as the first component is concerned, I would identify as trends that have been characterizing our industry over almost half a century, all aiming at satisfying with maximum efficiency and effectiveness the needs of a steadily increasing world trade volume of as the following. A trend to build ever bigger ships to take advantages of the economies of scale. A trend which of necessity has led ports and offshore terminals to grow commensurately both in size and facilities. A trend to standardize the design, construction, and equipment of ships to reduce the building costs and time and to easily supply them with spare parts wherever they may find themselves in the world. A trend to build specific ships for specific trends to increase efficiency and avoid delays. And a trend to introduce principles of automation for, among others, ship propulsion and maneuvering and cargo handling to reduce accidents, delays, and operational costs, and increase efficiency. This have of late inevitably been amplified by a trend spread, spread by the frantic search for oil and gas offshore to satisfy the needs of an ever hungrier industry and an ever growing world population, design and build highly sophisticated ships, platforms, and units of the most advanced technology, such as oil rigs, offshore platforms, dynamically positioned ships, mobile offshore drilling units, EFSOs and production, storage, and regasification <coughs> units, supported by offshore support vessels and other purpose-built ships and units. With tonnage over capacity continuing to have a negative impact on the behavior of shipping markets, one should look for favorable developments in the economy of Europe for an improvement in the container ship sector and favorable, favorable developments in the Far East for an improvement in the bulk cargo ship sector. A return to around 10% of the Chinese economy annual growth from the current 7% and to around 7% from the current 5% of the Indian economy will be welcome news for shipping with good performance 
before the 2008 economic and financial crisis, greatly dependent on the unprecedented growth of the economies of the two countries I just mentioned. At the same time, one should follow closely developments in the shipping markets once shale and oil gas discovered on shore in the United States, gas in Australia and Qatar, and offshore in Brazil and Mozambique, not to mention onshore Kenya and Ethiopia, comes upstream and starts feeding economy starving of some sources of energy. Whilst one would expect a downgrading of the strategic importance and significance of the shipping routes between Nigeria and the United States and between Venezuela and again the United States. Once the latter becomes self-sufficient in oil first, probably by 2020, and then exporter of same later on, possibly by 2030, one should also expect a favorable reaction of the respective shipping markets following the lengthening of distance and time to run the new shipping routes from Africa and Brazil to the Far East. The recently reported undertaking by the United States to supply gas to Europe following the threat of Russia to discontinue some supplying the old continent through a pipeline as a result of economic sanctions imposed or threatened to be imposed by the United States and the European Union in the context of the East-West dispute over developments in Ukraine will certainly be good news for the energy sector of shipping. And as far as the container ship sector in particular is concerned, we should wait to see how the transit fee situation will stabilize in the Panama Canal post-expansion era. Turning now to the second component of my speech team, the challenges ahead. This is how I would envisage things with an impact on shipping to, to evolve over the coming two to three decades without, however, wishing to compromise the integrity and clarity of my crystal ball and admitting all along that the, in this rapidly changing world, it would be risky to predict even things that may happen tomorrow. Population and economic growth will drive energy demand higher with the world shifting towards lower carbon fuels and making more efficient use of the energy sources available. The center of economic activity will continue shifting towards Asia, which, as things stand at present, seems to have all the ingredients necessary for it to be an engine for growth for decades to come, while China, India, Brazil, and South Africa are predicted to play a more dominant role in global trade than present. While China's economic development currently depends on oil imported from abroad, and the International Energy Agency predicts that by 2035, a quarter of Iraqi oil will be heading to that country, provided, of course, that the exporting country, Iraq, returns to political stability, who can foresee today with any degree of accuracy how the economies of the Asian region and the Pacific Rim and the demand of shipping and the structure of shipping routes will be affected one, once the reserves of oil and gas that scientists say exists in the South China Sea, an area more than five times the the territory of France starts being exploited, or when China increases its production of oil and gas from her apparently huge reserves on shore. And with the United States becoming the fastest growing oil and gas producer in the world, having the potential to surpass Saudi Arabia by 2020, who can predict the geopolitical developments that will ensure once the U.S. becomes energy self-sufficient as well, or when this boom 
combined with rising production from Canadian oil sands and tight oil, and an expected resurgence in Mexico's oil industry could make North America self-sufficient in energy in a couple of decades. In such emerging circumstances, should we worry about the impact they may have on and the future of the corresponding shipping sectors? I think not. As demand for shipping services from newly discovered huge oil and gas reserves of Brazil and the east coast of Africa and around Madagascar, not to mention the wealth in energy resources hidden in the deep Arctic waters, will create new opportunities and challenges for the industry to move in and exploit. Among those, one should include the revolution as a recent environment summit held in London grounded it from the arrival of shale gas, the impact of which on the energy industry will, it has been argued, be monumental. Drawing a parallel between the impact oil had when it replaced coal as a fuel for transportation since the 1920s, the summit noted that thanks to shale, gas is poised to take over from coal as a global fuel for power generation as well as for transport. Putting aside for a moment the associated huge geopolitical consequences, the summit also recognized that the impact of shale gas on LNG shipping meant more cargoes once new exports entered into the game. Shale has the potential to change the geopolitical dynamic if it has not already done so. And what about other sectors and ship types? Speaking at the North Shipping Conference in Oslo in 2011, I referred to container trades, which at the time were facing their shortest ever cycle, while in the dry bulk markets, we could not be overexcited either. Things have not changed much ever since. And although one should differentiate among grades for VLCCs, Aframaxes, and product carriers, one could not ignore the sluggish tanker tank, market that has seen rates falling dramatically and earnings struggling to rise above operating costs. Observing at the Oslo conference that in defiance of the many negative trends in the world economy, the shipping industry had hit record numbers with 85,000 ships, each of more than 100 gross registered tons. Now the number approximates 100,000 units. Totaling 1 billion gross tons, worth almost 1 trillion US dollars. I wondered whether it was wise to place post the 2007, 2004 to 2007 euphoric period so many orders for new buildings, as growth in the supply side of shipping seemed set to outpace growth in short term demand and fleet utilization to drop be below the levels usually regarded as comfortable. Two years ago, placing the expansion of the world fleet within the relatively slower growth of world trade and the resulting widening gap between supply of and demand for tonnage, I wondered how long the imbalance would last and when would the recovery in shipping would commence. The consensus view at the time was an average of three years. If that estimate was correct, then we should move into the recovery stage as from this year. Has this happened? In some sectors, almost. In others, still lags behind. It should, however, be, ladies and gentlemen, in the analysis of the geopolitical developments around the globe that one could be able to form an idea about the shape of things to come before one attempts to make strategic decisions. For example, what will happen when the US does not need any more 
to the extent it does today, the oil it imports from the Persian Gulf today? Will there be developments affecting its, na its naval presence in the region at the level it is displayed nowadays? And if, if so, who will move in to fill the gap? <laughs> Incidentally, this was a question I was asking myself before the recent developments in Iraq. How will the situation in the Indian Ocean develop and what role India will claim for itself in a changing situation in a geographical region in which she sees herself playing quite naturally, of course, a protagonistic role? What will the repercussions for shipping be in Iran against the recent good omens if Iran goes ahead with its nuclear program? <coughs> a development which has the potential to destabilize the status quo in the Middle East. What will be the outcome of the Syrian conflict? And how will it affect the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean? And how will Russia react to the probability of losing its naval base in Latakia in the event the anti-government forces win the day? And what about the political aspect of the recent find of gas in this area between Cyprus and Israel. How will neighboring countries react to this new Eldorado? If a diplomatic solution is not found, and North Korea goes ahead with its nuclear program, how will shipping routes used nowadays to replenish China, Japan, Japan and South Korea be affected? I do not mention on purpose the issue between China and Japan, over a group of islands in between them, because I feel confident a diplomatic solution will be worked out to the satisfaction of both sides and the benefit of peace, security, and stability in the wider region. And what if more oil and gas is found around the Falklands, Mal Falklands Malvinas Islands, which constitute a long standing dispute between Argentina and the United Kingdom? And finally, what toll will shipping continue to play to the sketch of piracy, which seems to have the capacity, when pushed out of a certain region, to move into another? Example, the appearance, diminishing, and resurgence of the phenomenon in areas such as the South China Sea, the Malacca Strait, the waters of Somalia, and the Gulf of Aden, in East, and the Gulf of Guinea, in West Africa. I know I have asked too many questions to digest in a speech, but I also know that my speech should be incomplete, were I not to say a few words about the environment and the undeniable need to protect and present, preserve it for these and generations to come. Should, should we neglect to do so now, we we'll do it at the peril of our children and theirs, and they will not forgive us for that. In my current world, the environment has of late come to signify both the marine and the atmospheric environment. As far as the marine environment is concerned, the news is good. Thanks to the hard and sustained work, work of the world community through IMO and the industry, and the, and the conscientious efforts of the seafarers, the operational and accidental pollution of the marine environment has reduced to less than a third than before the multifaceted IMO measures began being implemented some 10 years ago. This is a major achievement, and all those who contributed to it, governments, industry, and seafarers, deserve our recognition and appreciation. Where much work still needs to be done urgently and expeditiously, I should add, is in the front of climate change and global warming an issue with huge ramifications on all of us and the globe as a whole. Now that the overwhelming majority of studies point to a man-made climate change as the Intergovernmental Panel, panel on Climate Change, led by an Indian scientist, Dr. Pachali, has concluded we should stop dithering, let alone continue blaming one another for the state of the planet 
and instead joining forces to stem the further deterioration of the situation and reverse the trend. Given the current composition of world shipping and the international character of the industry, the much involved principle of common but differentiated responsibilities of the Kyoto Protocol cannot apply, and this should be understood by all governments. At the same time, governments should work together to reach, through compromise and consensus, universally accepted decisions made solely at high mode on issues such as prevention of air pollution, market-based measures to cut greenhouse gas emissions, balanced water management and ship recycling. I stress the need for decisions on the critical issues I just mentioned to be made solely at IMO because I am more than convinced that decisions to regulate an industry as international as shipping pursued outside the organization are doomed to fail. And failure on issues of such global significance and importance is not an option. Ladies and gentlemen, no speech on shipping would be complete without reference to those without whom the industry would not function, the seafarers. While I'll return to them later on, let me say a few words about them now. When we speak about them, we should realize that we are talking about fellow human beings, about the indispensable protagonists of an industry we cannot do without. And why we must always show them the respect they deserve for all they do for us, the sacrifices they endure, far away from their family and friends, we should intensify our efforts to provide them with the support they need to do their jobs effectively, efficiently, and above all, safely. And of course, we should always recognize that they are all individuals with their own personality and pride, with different cultures, religions, colors, languages, and dispositions. By trying to understand the fundamental aspects of human behavior, and that the human element is a key issue to addressing the pursuit of a profitable and safe shipping industry, we do nothing else but be giving credit where credit is due. We are all well aware that somewhere in the chain of events leading to accidents and costly incidents, there are people involved. And no matter how much more equipment we provide, systems we introduce, technology we develop, the, inset, the essential piece in the jigsaw is how people perform, doing the right thing at the right time. In thinking about people, and specifically the lot of today's seafarers, it is perhaps inevitable to look back to one's own early years. For me, that means looking back to the days when navigation meant wielding a sextant <coughs> and shooting the sun and stars, when a tom-tom was still a drum. Ballast water was not, apparently, full of wee pieces that were a danger to the marine environment, and drinking and smoking on board were very good. It is difficult not to wonder what has changed for the better. Ladies and gentlemen, I was introduced as the former Secretary General of IMO, the capacity that fills me <coughs> with pride. But I stand before you today in two other capacities that fill me with equal pride as well. I speak to you as the proud chairman of the Maria Chappos Foundation in Greece and as the proud patron of the International Seafarers Welfare Trust. In our foundation, we seek to promote maritime research and preserve tradition in the maritime domain, while we believe that our industry needs to move, to move ahead with innovation, we are cautious to ensure that it does so in pace with the human element and innovation. We cannot have one running ahead of the other. We need to coordinate how we do this. At the same time, we embrace the premise that the world cannot do without shipping, and that shipping cannot function without seafarers. 
No wonder, therefore, that in going about our various activities, we are motivated by our love and affection for those at the sharp end of the industry. It was against such a background that last year we organized an international seminar in Athens to facilitate the wide and effective implementation of the 2006 ILO Maritime Convention, which came into force in August 2013. This is a global convention that regulates matters of immense importance to shipping, and in particular the seafarers, such as safety, working conditions, health, repatriation, and welfare, issues that we promote in the Welfare Trust I mentioned a little while ago. Furthermore, in October of this year, we run a one-day forum entitled Shipping in the 21st Century to provide an opportunity to shipping experts from around the world to examine and analyze the current and future state of the industry amidst the fast political, economic, and technological developments the world experiences on a daily basis. And I'll be delighted to see as many of you as possible coming to Athens to lend us your knowledge and experience in seeking optimal solutions to the various issues facing the shipping industry today and in the foreseeable future. Training is indispensable in all human activities, including shipping, let alone in an industry such as the offshore industry, which by the mere fact that it operates in a hostile environment, in its titanic efforts to explore and produce oil and gas from the bottom of the sea, hundreds of meters below the surface, thus facing many challenges and, and occasionally the risks of the unexpected requires skills and experience of the highest level. Not to mention the need for those working in the offshore industry to master technologies of the most advanced standard. As the assets invested and the stakes in any offshore venture are very high, it follows that those in whose hands the offshore business is entrusted must be properly educated and trained. This is, a task of, this is the task and mission of special institutions, such as the NUSI Offshore Tra Technical Training Institute, which I had the honor to inaugurate here in Mumbai last November. With recent discoveries in the Indian Ocean of huge oil and gas reserves, spurred by geopolitical developments in the wider region, and natural disasters beyond it, the LNG industry in particular, which much depends on offshore operations, is destined to see days of growth and prosperity. When this new era dawns, with the new industry growing in size larger than today's, India will be ready to take advantage and prosper. I wish the subcontinent and, and all its offshore activities every success. It's in gentlemen an issue that is increasingly increasingly gain, is increasingly gaining ground nowadays, both in importance and significance, is that of social responsibility, which is defined by ISO as the responsibility of an organization for the impacts of its decisions and activities on society and the environment through transparent and ethical behavior that one contributes to sustainable development, including health and the welfare of society, two takes into account the expectations of st stakeholders, three is in compliance with applicable law and consistent with international norms of, norms of behavior, and four is integrated throughout the organization and practice. Today, most large companies in industries of a comparable size to shipping, for example, automotive, electronic, apparel, toys, petroleum, have strong formal CSR programs in place. Multimodal shippers such as DHL and FedEx, to mention just two, are championing this, the concept in the logistic industry. 
Shipping is no different from any other industry in that both collectively and individually, ship owners and operators need to protect their brand image. They need to be confident that they can demonstrate to a whole variety of audiences, such as investors, charters, insurers, corporate customers, and environmental activists, that their ships and their operations are safe and environmentally sound. Ship owners need to be aware that even if they themselves can manage to operate away from the glare of publicity and the pressure of customer concerns, these are now becoming key issues for many of their customers. As a result, those customers will increasingly be looking to manage their exposure in this regard by selecting business partners, including shipping companies, that have clear and verifiable corporate social responsibility policies. Nobody, be they ship operators, ship owners, or their customers, wants the embarrassment, embarrassment of seeing their ships or their cargo making headlines for all the wrong reasons. Reasons which might include anything from illegal oil discharges through poorly treated seafarers to a full-blown shipping casualty. So shipping as a whole needs, along with all the other industries, to be able to show that it has, for example, cultivated a reliable and well-trained labor force and has good environmental, health, and safety policies built into its day-to-day -day operations. Developing and sustaining a safety culture and environmental conscience will do much to enhance its image worldwide. The clear message that we have to take forward is that balanced decisions for our future require the integration of social, economic, and environmental considerations. Business is not and cannot be divorced from the rest of society. Business and society are interdependent. If we are to build a better future, concepts such as CSR and diversity in employment must become more than simply the latest business trends or funds. They must be given more than lip service. They must be taken seriously, acted upon, and prompted widely, and by all concern. To bring my speech to a close, to your relief, I thought I would recall a story from my relative youth, which goes something like this. The topic of the discussion was a large empty glass jar which had originally held pickled onions. The jar, I was told, was a metaphor for life. It had been filled with pebbles from the beach, which I was told represented the rocks upon which my future would be based. My parents, my wife, my family, and I was asked whether the jar was full, which it was. My mentor, then took a few handfuls of gravel from the beach and let them trickle into the jar, filling the spaces between the pedals, which he said represented the necessities of life. A job, a home, a car, and I was asked where, where, where the jar, and thus the life that it represented, was now full, to which I agreed it was. My friend, then scraped some sand from the beach and dip that into the jar, filling the remaining space between the pebbles and the gravel, which he said represented the luxuries of life. A lover, foreign holidays, jewelry, valuable antiques, etc., which I agreed now filled the jar completely. And keeping to the metaphor, my future life was thus complete. In answer to this, my mentor pick, picked up his glass and poured the remainder of his beer into the jar, thus proving to my complete satisfaction that no matter how full your life, there is always room for beer. <laughs> ladies, ladies and gentlemen, let, let me finish 
by returning to the man we have gathered to honor here today, Dr. Sipis Srivastava. Few of you will know that he was a heavy drinker. He was able to drink in one evening a fully laden VLCC <laughs> of water. Of water. Because of his social life, he would go to receptions, to dinners, where he was offered various drinks, whiskey, gin, Campari, and uh, he thought that it was impolite of him always to say no, 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 no. So, so he had uh, introduced the concept of saying, yes, please, can I have gin and tonic without gin? <laughs> Let me now paint one of his uh, other sides of the multifaceted multi talent which is Dr. Sipisi Vastava, that of the teacher in the wider sense of the word. I hear you asking, the teacher? What did he teach? I'll tell you. He taught that the world, this beautiful planet that houses us all and provides a roof to put our head under is not the privilege of the few. The rich developed, industrialized, but the residents of all of us, the wealthy, less wealthy, and the poor. Launching his campaign from this premise, he set out to ensure that IMO was no longer the rich man's club, as I said before. <coughs> And as the organization was at the beginning of his office at IMO Brandt. But an organization representative of all peoples and all countries of the world, from the north and the south, the east and the west. He traveled to scores of countries to explain why it was in the best interest of developing countries to become, along with the, the developed ones, members of the organization, to invest in shipping to direct their youths to the maritime profession and to reap the fruits of a uniform and harmonized approach to safer ships and cleaner oceans. His persuasive powers, persuasive, persuasive powers were, were so effective that when he left the organization in 1990, two thirds of the animal members were, to his great satisfaction, developing countries. While working assiduously to achieve that objective, he tirelessly promoted two other aims held close to his heart. The human element at sea and the protection and preservation of the marine environment. He succeeded in both as the organization adopted under, under his leadership and as I said before, three milestone brand new international conventions on standards of training, certification, and watchkeeping for seafarers, maritime search and rescue, and prevention of marine pollution from ships. When Dr. Srivastava passed one year, one year ago, he left us all, family and friends, IMO, the shipping industry, and his beloved India, the poor. With his death, we lost a friend and the mentor. Shipping lost a great servant, and India lost one of her most distinguished sons. We miss him dearly, and the least we can do for that great man is to remember him with love, affection, and respect. Events like this serve this purpose, and the Tolani Maritime Institute deserves congratulations for doing, 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 doing just that. Let us all work together to ensure that CP's legacy is on and on and on. For us to remember him and for those to succeed us to learn and be enlightened by his example. Amen and thank you. <laughs> <laughs>